My name is Jade Adams. I'm currently a student at McGill University working towards my Master's of Arts in Teaching and Learning. And presently I'm working in the EWHG, a Cree community called Waswatapi in association with the Cree School Board and a nonprofit that runs extracurricular activities in uh, the Cree School Board schools. So I'm a program coordinator. And uh, one of these things, one of these terms, one of these theories that's been so connected to a lot of the work I've done uh, is at-risk youth. But one of the things that I think we really need to take into consideration is not only just what an at-risk youth is, how we can help them, but also talking about how we talk about at-risk youth. Through reading the Individual and Group Differences chapter uh, in my educational psychology class, I came to realize that not only have I never worked with a group that couldn't be fit into the category of being at risk, but I also realized that I, growing up, did fit into that category as well. I came from a single parent family. I, after living with a single parent, my single parent also couldn't take care of me, so I moved in with my grandparents. Uh, neither of them went on to higher education. In fact, my grandfather never even completed any elementary school. And I was just uh, always also from a lower socioeconomic background, and uh, there was a history of drug and alcohol abuse in my family. There were a lot of factors preventing me from getting to where I was going. And if we're talking about at-risk youth, another theory that works in conjunction and gives some hope to some of these students who are at risk is the theory of resiliency. So how some students overcome these challenges, overcome these obstacles, and then work towards their goals anyway and do succeed in uh, the education system and even go on to higher education like I did. So now let's Let's do it. Let's define at-risk youth. What is an at-risk youth? So an at-risk youth is a youth that might not necessarily complete the whole trajectory as they're supposed to. They might not start in kindergarten, go through every grade as they're supposed to, get to graduation, get their diploma, go on to vocational school, go on to find a job, contribute to society, do whatever they're gonna do. They might have a lot of challenges that are making it so much harder for them to realize this goal compared to their peers. And even if they do realize this goal, one of the challenges for them as well is that they might not have obtained all of the necessary skills to actually use this diploma towards their success in life. They might not be able to find a job. They might not be able to pursue post-secondary education. And even if they try to raise a family, for example, there might be certain skills that they're lacking. There might be uh, certain obstacles that they still face as adults that will prevent them from contributing to society in the, the way that they could, the way, if they, the way they could if they could reach their full potential. Based on a study by Garnier, Stein, and Jacobs done in 1997, they found that a lot of students have a history of academic failure that can be dating back to grade 3. So as early as grade 3, there are characteristics by which to identify these students who might not be able to complete school as easily as their peers. I've actually encountered some of these students. I remember one particular instance running an educational summer camp where one of the students upon the first day of camp knew that his two siblings got kicked out due to their disruptive violent behavior and he expected to be kicked out as well. So the other students would comment on how he had a bad family life, how he was a bad kid, and the student would yell at me sometimes saying, I know you're gonna kick me out, why don't you just kick me out if you're gonna do it? He had the experience already, being as young as grade three or four, of knowing that his teachers would kick him out of class. Another factor to take into consideration is that students who are at risk often don't feel any psychological attachment to school. They're not involved with extracurriculars, and they don't see school as somewhere that's a safe environment or somewhere where they're learning things that are relevant to their life. A study by Crooks, Berm, and other researchers done in 2017 actually found that First Nations, Inuit, and Minty youth could be protected against some of the at-risk factors through mentoring. So they set up a mentoring program, it was sustained, it was culturally, culturally relevant, and it helped the students have positive role models in their lives. There's been a shift in the research moving towards looking at positive things to do instead of punishing negative behaviors, just trying to replace them with these positive programs. So thinking about the underlying ideas and assumptions about at-risk youth, I started to think about how instead of saying 
a youth who is at risk, we say at risk youth, which goes against the rule that you don't use a descriptor to describe the whole person, such as a person with disabilities, not a disabled person. Doing some research, I saw that an article by NPR Education echoed some of the concerns that I was having about the term at risk youth. This article by NPR actually goes over the different terms that were used. So starting as early as the 19th century, an at-risk youth would have been defined as a juvenile delinquent. Following this, in the 20th century, it became very popular to call at-risk youth dropouts. The term at-risk youth actually became popularized in 1983 following a report called A Nation at Risk. Even more surprising was a term that came after, which was super predator. Super Predator came from a 1995 article by DeLulio, and DeLulio was talking about the threat that these at-risk juvenile delinquents could cause to the whole nation. Bridgeland coined the term opportunity youth in 2012 to put a positive spin on the idea of at-risk youth, seeing them instead as youth that could succeed and reach their full potentials if those around them take the right steps to help them. Andrew Mason, a teacher who was interviewed as part of the NPR article, said that using these disparaging terms actually makes it hard for people to believe that we really want to help these youth. So I've experienced some of this negativity myself when I talk about my job, because people will often congratulate me on the hard work that I'm doing in a First Nations community, or talk about how nice it is that I'm helping the poor children. So the people I'm talking to, though they are trying to probably compliment me on the work that I'm doing, are actually using some assumptions about First Nations youth feeding into stereotypes and thinking about at-risk youth and all of the bad things that come along with being an at-risk youth. Dr. Victor Rios, a professor of sociology, finds that the way you label somebody can change how you treat them. These ideas came from a TED talk that I watched where Rios describes how he doesn't want youth to be called at risk, he'd prefer that they be called at promise. In his book, Punish, Policing the Lives of Black and Latino Boys, Rios goes on to explain that a lot of the time when we're looking to describe at-risk youth or looking to understand them, we talk to the wrong people. He touches upon when we're thinking about at-risk youth, how we often think about a big group instead of thinking about the individual or their voices or their needs, the help that they need. I think we forget that the students, though they might not know the label, they do know that they're at a disadvantage. I had a student who was working on a project who at some point got so discouraged that he was telling me that he was worried he wasn't gonna graduate and that he was just gonna become a stereotype of a drunk native, because although he might not be aware of all of the factors that are influencing him and all of the obstacles that he's facing and what the term at-risk youth means, he does know how people stereotype him. In ending our conversation about at-risk youth, we need to try to figure out ways that we can change at-risk youth into opportunity youth, at-promise youth, change them into resilient and strong youth. There are a number of things we can do. One of the things is to identify the students as soon as possible. We can also create positive and warm learning environments, and make sure that the curriculum is relevant to their daily lives. We also need to communicate high expectations of academic success. There should be no bias against anybody in any class. Also, as mentioned before, we need to find ways to help the students identify with school and see school as something that is important to them. Morrison and Allen, in 2007 describe a number of ways that school personnel can ensure that students are resilient. They think about resiliency theory, thinking about the individual and the school environment both as protective factors, but also potentially at-risk factors. So it's not just the individual that plays the main role, the school environment itself can have a positive or negative impact. Ann and Wexler 2017 do a meta-analysis of positive youth development programs to compare many different programs that are meant to have positive impacts on students. Meta-analysis showed that pro-social behavior with peers, as well as good relationships with adults, were two of the best protective factors. I leave you with a quote that I became familiar with working in the EWSG. This quote is by late Grand Chief Billy Diamond. Billy Diamond said that great obstacles make great leaders. This idea taps into a lot of what we've been talking about. The movement from at-risk to at-promise to opportunity to resiliency. One of the characteristics of opportunity youth is that because they have overcome great hardships, they are more motivated to succeed. Though the quote by Billy Diamond comes from many years ago and isn't as recent as the study, his idea really connects with the idea that some of the students who are going to have to overcome the most challenges, who are gonna face the most hardships, are gonna be the ones that can actually contribute greatly to society if we give them a chance and if we figure out how we're gonna help them.